Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on the boycott of Israeli academic institutions. My name is Jessica Winnegar, and I teach anthropology and Middle East and North African studies at Northwestern University. Today, I'm joined by three distinguished guests who I will introduce in a moment. This is the third of a series of webinars uh, designed to inform the American Anthropological Association membership about the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, or BDS. The goal of today's session is to answer some frequently asked questions about the call to boycott Israeli academic institutions. The American Anthropological Association is currently, starting today, voting on a boycott referendum. The voting is open until July 14th, and we urge all listeners to vote. But first, some essential background on BDS. BDS was inspired by the South African anti-apartheid movement when over 170 Palestinian civil society organizations launched a BDS movement in 2005 as a way to hold the Israeli government accountable for ongoing human rights violations. These violations at this time are widely recognized by human rights organizations and social movements around the world as apartheid. Activists around the globe have responded to this campaign with calls for economic divestment and the boycott of Israeli institutions, including academic institutions. Most recently, the Middle East Studies Association passed a similar resolution to the one before the AAA membership. Before it, the British Society for Middle East Studies passed a boycott resolution. So too have the American Studies Association, the Association for Asian American Studies, the National Women's Studies Association, the Arab American Studies Association, the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, and the National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies. It is now time for anthropologists to join those associations and stand up for the rights of Palestinians and against racism and apartheid. So today we hope to clear up some misconceptions about the boycott, including some that are circulating, that are trafficking and really baseless fear mongering about what a boycott would mean for academic associations. Before I introduce the speakers, let me just encourage you to visit our website, anthroboycott.org. We have a wealth of fact-based information and uh, perspectives from Israelis and Palestinians uh, on the boycott at that website. You can also view prior webinars on this same YouTube channel, um, including our first one, which featured our academic colleagues in Palestine urging us, telling us why we should support their call for solidarity. The second webinar featured anthropologists from across the spectrum who showed us how boycott connects and intersects with other movements for decolonization and demilitarization and abolition. So now uh, I would like to introduce our speakers. We are honored today to have Omar Barghouti with us. Omar is a Palestinian human rights defender and co-founder of the Palestinian-led BDS movement for Palestinian rights. He's a co-recipient of the 2017 Gandhi Peace Award. He holds a BSc and MSc in electrical engineering from Columbia and is currently pursuing a PhD in philosophy at the University of Amsterdam. As a Palestinian academic and activist, he is the author of BDS, The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights, and his commentaries have appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, and, on, and he's also been on MSNBC and CNN. He has an article coming out tomorrow on the, in The Nation on boycott, so look out for that. We're also delighted to have Zoha Khalili here. Zoha is a senior staff attorney at Palestine Legal. She provides legal advice and advocacy support to activists in the movement for Palestinian freedom on issues related to uh, free speech violations, discrimination, disciplinary charges, um, to also doxing, surveillance, and threats. We are also joined by Maya Wind, who is a Killam postdoctoral fellow in anthropology at the University of British Columbia. Her research on the reproduction and international export of Israeli security expertise has been founded by the funded by the National Science Foundation and the Social Science Research Council. 
She is also a member of Boycott from Within, Israelis in support of the BDS movement. So thank you all of us for, all of you for joining us um, in this important conversation. Um, I have a first round of questions. Uh, first, let's start with Omar. You are a founder of the BDS movement for Palestinian rights and the impact of that movement is being felt today not just on campuses and social justice struggles around the world, but also in Hollywood, on Capitol Hill, and in city halls across the country. So not all AAA members are uh, familiar with the Palestinian civil society call to BDS and the call to boycott Israeli academic institutions specifically. So can you just speak to how the BDS call came about and why the campaign decided to include Israeli universities on the boycott list? Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Jessica. Actually, we did not include Israeli universities. We started with them. Some people might consider it irrational. You know, we brown people can be slightly irrational. Uh, actually, we knew what we were doing. In 2004, after many months of debates and uh, community meetings and consultations with solidarity movement academics and artists and writers and so on, uh, Palestinian academics and cultural figures launched the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, uh, PACB, which specifically called to comprehensively and consistently boycott all Israeli academic and cultural institutions as a contribution to the struggle to end Israel's occupation, colonization, and system of apartheid." End of quote. So this call for an institutional targeted boycott was endorsed by the largest trade unions, professional associations, the Palestinian Federation of Unions of University Professors and Employees, uh, among others. A year later, the BDS call, the general call of academic emb military embargo, economic came out, uh, endorsed by pretty much a consensus in Palestinian society, both in historic Palestine as well as uh, in exile. So why did we start with academic institutions? Uh, it might uh, um, you know, ra raise a question. Well, there are two compelling reasons. First, Israeli universities are not simply complicit in Israel's regime of settler colonialism and apartheid. They've consistently been for decades a pillar in the design, implementation, justification, and whitewash of almost every aspect of oppression perpetrated by this regime. And the second reason is that given their exceptionally potent role in whitewashing Israeli crimes, uh, those universities role, that is, an effective academic boycott would irreversibly hurt Israel's brand and feed the growing calls for economic boycotts and, uh, and targeted sanctions, obviously. So briefly, Israeli universities systematically provide the military intelligence establishment with indispensable research, not just in weapons technologies and engineering, but also archaeology, demography, geography, hydrology, psychology, philosophy, you name it, in every discipline, they're very much part and parcel of the system. Uh, and they even uh, uh, reward racist speech and theories and bogus scientific research that echo 19th century European biological race theories. Until now, they're popular in Israeli universities. Dehumanizing, or what I call relativizing the humanity of indigenous Palestinians to justify killing us, dispossessing us, ethnically cleansing us. So I'll just give one shocking example, basically. Tel Aviv University's Institute for National Security Studies takes credit for developing the so-called Dahia Doctrine, adopted by the Israeli army, which calls for, quote, the destruction of the national civilian infrastructure and intense suffering among the civilian population, end of quote, as a means to defeat irregular resistance forces. The academic boycott also comes as a response to the complicity of silence of Israeli universities in response to Israel's relentless and uh, deliberate attack on Palestinian education, which some Palestinian scholars have termed scholasticide, going back to the 1948 Nakba. During the Nakba of ethnic cleansing and, and, and soon after, tens of thousands of Palestinian books were plundered from Palestinian homes, schools, libraries in Jaffa, Haifa, Safad, and other Palestinian cities by Zionist militias and later the Israeli army, destroyed or kept in Israeli university libraries. In the first few weeks of the Palestinian uh, uprising or Intifada in 1987, Israel shut down all Palestinian universities, then all schools, and then all kindergartens, prompting Palestinians effectively to build an illegal network for underground education. So the complicity of Israeli universities 
is not just doesn't just end there. It also extends to students and scholars who are Palestinian citizens of present-day Israel. Structural racism in Israel's education system it reaches not just universities, but all the way down to kindergartens. As early as 2001, Human Rights Watch, for example, concluded, quote, discrimination at every level of the Israeli education system winnows out a progressively larger proportion of Palestinian Arab children as they progress through the school system or channels those who persevere away from the opportunities of higher education. The hurdles Palestinian Arab students face from kindergarten to university function like a series of seeds with sequentially finer holes, end of quote. So to sum it up, Bakbi is part of the BDS movement, which calls for ending occupation, settler colonialism, and apartheid uh, by focusing on an institutional boycott. BDS does not target individuals. It targets institutions. It does not target identity. It targets complicity. And it's fully anchored in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and opposes all forms of racism, including, obviously, anti-Semitism. Excellent. Thank you so much. I hope that clarifies for our viewers the, the history of the boycott movement and the continued uh, scholasticide, really, that, that is happening as a result of the Israeli occupation and the, and the clear role that universities play not only in developing technologies um, and ideologies of occupation, but also direct attacks on students' academics and, and the institutions of universities themselves. Thank you also for talking about Israeli academic institutions as, as a pillar of the occupation, not just, and, and that boycotting them actually can have a, um, a tremendous effect on the economic boycott because we do have people who say why not just do economic boycott and not also uh, and not the institutional boycott and those things are very linked so thank you for for bringing that up um so turning to zoha as the bds movement gains traction the state of israel and zionist organizations have increasingly turned to intimidation tactics and even criminalizing speech on palestinian and bds campaigns in the united states and elsewhere we have seen a bit of this at the AAA in a prior campaign in 2015, 2016 to pass a BDS resolution, which by the way, only failed by 39 votes. So people should vote. <laughs> Palestine legal the organization you work with has been at the forefront of fighting back against this, including you have successfully defended other academic associations endorsing the academic boycott. Can you speak to the efforts to chill student and faculty organizing for Palestinian rights? And can you speak to why it's important for academics to insist on our right to continue to organize for Palestinian rights? Thanks so much for that question. Um, so the reason why Palestine Legal exists as an organization is this understanding that as we, we as a society learn about what's going on in Palestine, and as people are able to organize and build people power, they're able to create change and you know end us funding to israel and around, allow palestinians to demand their freedom and to demand liberation um and there's been this huge effort across society to try to restrict that activism um in order to prevent israel from facing any kind of criticism any kind of like restrictions or questioning and so the the role that we play here is is to try to prevent people from using the law or for us to use the law to defend people against um efforts to silence them in a variety of ways um campuses in particular have long been at the heart of social justice movements as a place where young people are first encountering challenges to the their ways of presumed notions and their ways of thinking it's their first opportunity to develop their own understanding of their place in the world and because campuses are built around, you know, instilling knowledge and demanding critical thinking, and because they're the place where we're trying to equip the next generation with the skills and information that they'll be able to use for the rest of their lives, and because they're a space that's offering a sense of community that's often lacking in the modern world, it's such a fertile ground for organizing across a variety of social justice issues, and particularly about Palestine. And so if you're looking at the younger generation in polling, you see a, a big shift in their understanding of this situation and their support for Palestinian rights. And that is something that terrifies the Israeli government, which has put a lot of funding into preventing in particular boycott, divestment and sanctions efforts. 
Um, and so one thing that I, I just want to talk about is that these threats against campus organizing are coming from a, a variety of different levels. So there is one sense where they're coming from government officials. Um, and that's something that Israel advocacy groups have, have been focused on in trying to establish anti-boycott laws, which we're going to talk about a little bit, and trying to um, adopt a particular definition of anti-Semitism, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, which includes things like calling the state of Israel a racist endeavor, even though there have been well-documented reports put out by international human rights organizations that do document the state of apartheid in Israel. Um, the idea is that that is going to be classified as a form of anti-Semitism that allows governments and that allows universities to try to punish those organizing efforts. And because of those, because of that work, um, you often see administrators, um, both at public and private institutions, um, concerned around, for example, their ability to get funding from the federal government um, because they might face civil rights investigations if they allow Palestine organizing on campus. Um, we also see um, attacks from within the, the, the institution because of, of the concerns around funding. Um, at private institutions, there might be a concern around whether the um, university will continue to get donations from people who have an interest in protecting Israel. Um, but we're also seeing that at public institutions where you would expect there to be a, a greater level of independence from those um, private funding interests. But for example, at the University of Washington last year, there was a, a $5 million endowment that, I mean, a $5 million gift that was made to their Israel Studies program that was returned to the donor because the donor disagreed with the, the endowed, like the, the chair's um, positions uh, criticizing Israel and a support of a petition that was recognizing Palestinian rights. And so there is that that financial um, pressure on administrators and this effort to try to shut down anything that might be controversial that might uh, hurt their funding streams. Um, and then we're also seeing a lot of third party attacks on um, professors and faculty, for example, websites like Stop Antisemitism or Canary Mission that are creating these profiles that are um, documenting Palestine activism and portraying it as a form of anti-Semitism or as something hateful or as something that is um, supportive of terrorism, for example. And you can see that online. And then you also see that come out in, in the physical world where there's these posters being put up on campus targeting Palestine activists and branding them as terrorists. And that is incredibly intimidating for both professors and students. Um, for students, you know, they are in a more vulnerable position, but we're seeing increasingly academics also being placed in a vulnerable position as we're seeing like tenure protections being weakened, as we're seeing more adjuncts being relied upon who don't have that same job security as a tenured professor might have. And so there is this effort to try to um, target you know, both students and faculty in order to prevent this, this place that is really a seed for activism that people carry with them um, throughout their lives. I actually, I haven't been keeping track of time. I wanted to just use like one case example to talk about this, but I don't know if I have time for that. Let's see. Um, yeah, if you could do it in a couple of minutes, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so one thing I want to talk about um, right now is, is something that's been in the media recently that just really describes those different levels of censorship. It's not involving a professor, it's involving a student, um, which is the graduation speaker at the City University of New York Law School, um, Fatima Mohammed, who has been facing a lot of attacks, um, particularly in the Zionist media, but also from politicians. So um, Fatima Mohammed was elected by her peers as the graduation speaker. And in her speech, she you know, talked about the importance of their law school's commitment to social justice and progressive values. And so she criticized, for example, the New York Police Department. And she also criticized the Israeli government and talked about the efforts on their campus to organize around this issue. Um, they had a BDS resolution passed both by students and also by faculty at the CUNY Law School. Um, and so the attacks that we saw on her um, first began before she even gave her speech. So there was an expectation by the university that she run her um, uh, her prepared remarks um, by them before she was allowed to make that speech, which is not um, an expectation that we had heard of in the past. It's this new 
requirement. I don't know if it was enacted specifically because the students had elected her or if it was something that was already in place, but there was that sense of, of needing to have that prior approval, which was a, a new hurdle that we hadn't seen in the past. Um, once her remarks were made, uh, we saw in um, reactionary newspapers like the New York Post, she was being portrayed as spreading hate speech. And then that prompted the Board of Trustees at the City University of New York to put out a message saying that her speech was not um, something that is protected by the First Amendment. So they were saying that there is hate speech that's not protected by the First Amendment, which is a total distortion of the law. She was not engaging in hate speech. I think she was engaging in a very loving speech there. But there was um, this effort to portray that as something that should have been prohibited, even though the law doesn't allow that. Um, and then at the same time, we saw government officials not only condemning her. So, for example, Richie Torres, who um, gets um, the largest amount of funding from APAC, um, who put out a message condemning her. We also saw that coming from Ted Cruz. And then we saw APAC then in turn applauding them for the, their remarks. But then we're also seeing legislative efforts being introduced um, to say, for example, that institutions that allow um, events that violate this IHRA definition of anti-Semitism to take place would then lose their government funding. And there's been demands that the city of University of New York system be defunded just because they allowed this student to give this speech, even though they're now piling on. And then there's the personal attacks that she is facing um, across the internet. And I think it's very important for us to um, understand that when these attacks take place, if we back down from activism, that isolates the people who are choosing to stand up. And so the more and more people are talking about Palestine, the more protection that provides across the board, because it makes people understand that this is an important issue and that if other people are able to withstand these attacks, that you will be too. And that as a society, we'll be in a better place to be able to talk about not only Palestine, but other issues that then uh, face similar types of censorship that is modeled on the, the targeting of Palestine activism. Thank you so much. Those are incredibly important points. Um, I think that a lot of anthropologists may be concerned about um, potential attacks um, particularly, certainly the AAA leadership is concerned with potential attacks, but there is safety in numbers. And if we are going to answer this call to solidarity, which is coming from, you know, multiple uh, pro-Palestine activists around the globe, um, we have to be aware that we can we can stand together and we should stand with each other to withstand these attacks. I also just want to highlight, you know, a very well-known anthropologist many, many years ago named Lila Abaluga. Uh, anthropology listeners will know her. She wrote about uh, resistance being a diagnostic of power. It's a famous uh, thing that gets quoted in anthropology. The fact that um, these attacks are happening shows the power of the boycott movement, the power of the pro-Palestinian movement and its interconnected struggle with anti-racism around the world. The fact that these attacks are escalating in the past 20 years, along with the increasing support for Palestine, shows that speaking out and boycott actually are working. They are having an effect. And I just wanna connect this to draw the thread that Omar said, You know, uh, the, the, the original call came out nearly 25 years ago which by the way is like 40 years after the occupation started, well, 60 years after the founding of the state of Israel, Palestinians were, you know, uh, took a long time to and think about and make this call and decided that that was the time when it should happen and, and really um, urging us all to pay attention and wake up to this issue. That was almost 25 years ago. This is not a new radical issue. And um, thank you, Zoha, for raising this demographic shift. Younger generations are starting to see this struggle for Palestinian freedom as connected to other freedom struggles around the world, including increasing numbers of young Jewish uh, Americans supporting this movement. So thank you very much. Turning to Maya, an argument we frequently hear um, from those who oppose the academic boycott is that the Israeli Academy is independent and should not be held accountable for Israeli state violence. You've been conducting research on the role of Israeli universities in settler colonialism and apartheid. Can you share some of your findings um, that illuminate why Israeli universities are an appropriate target for boycott? Thank you, Jessica. Um, and it's an honor to be in conversation with Omar and Zoha, so thank you. Uh, building on extensive research by Palestinian scholars, including Pakbi, 
Uh, I have been conducting research into the complicity of Israeli universities in Israeli settler colonialism. And I could share countless examples from this research that point to systematic and ongoing collaborations between Israeli universities and the Israeli state that facilitate the daily violation of Palestinian rights. But let me just share today three examples of epistemological complicity or of knowledge produced in the service of colonization, military occupation, and apartheid. Uh, so first, and perhaps most directly relevant to many of us at the AAA, the discipline of archaeology in Israel is subordinated to Israeli colonialism. Departments of archaeology across Israeli universities work closely with the Israeli Antiquities Authority, the Israeli military, and Israeli settler organizations to conduct excavations and research in archaeological sites in the occupied Palestinian territory. This is an explicit violation of international law that strictly regulates the use of archaeological research by occupying powers, specifically the Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property, Regulation 43 of the Annex to the Hague Convention, and UNESCO's guidelines. I urge you all to read Nadia Borhaj's book, Facts on the Ground, that details the long history of Israeli archaeology in service of expropriating Palestinian lands and claiming historic Palestine as the Jewish national home. Uh, but crucially, this collaboration of Israeli universities in the project is ongoing. So just as an example, in 2021, Tel Aviv University and the Weizmann Institute collaborated with the Israeli Antiquities Authority to conduct research on scrolls excavated and seized from the occupied West Bank. The Department of Land and of Israel Studies and Archaeology at Bar Ilan University, more recently in 2022, embarked on a new dig in Khir Tibna on the lands of Palestinian residents of three villages in the occupied West Bank, including Nabi Saleh. Faculty from the Departments of Archaeology at Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University, and the University of Haifa have participated at digs in archaeological sites in, across occupied East Jerusalem. And this includes Ir David, the City of David, which is an antiquity site run by a Jewish settler organization, Elad, whose declared mission is to Judaize Palestinian East Jerusalem neighborhoods and expand Israeli sovereignty in the city. Elad oversees ongoing excavations that have been repeatedly shown to be wholly unscientific, destroying any remnants of the Islamic period at the sites they oversee to selectively curate a narrative about an exclusive Jewish history of Jerusalem. Nevertheless, Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University, and Bar Ilan University maintain ongoing collaboration with Elad at Ir David. And these Israeli archaeologists, it's important to understand, know exactly what they are doing. In a 2019 case, the Jerusalem District Court accepted a request to withhold the names of archaeologists who received permits to conduct excavations in the occupied West Bank, including the details of the permits and the exact locations and artifacts of the digs. The grounds for concealment were expressly to protect these archaeologists from the academic boycott and to shield Israel from accountability. Another example I want to highlight is Israeli Middle East studies a discipline that for decades has trained members of the military and security state. And this is also an ongoing project. Uh, as of 2019, Hebrew University's Department of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies is the host of Chabad Salot, a tailored degree program offered to elite Israeli intelligence soldiers. These soldiers complete a joint BA in Middle Eastern Studies and another selective field alongside military training for the intelligence corps. The university designated a space in one of its very few campus dorms to create a closed military base complete with guards, security cameras, and military vetting required for entry, where Chavatzalot soldiers train, study, and live together, separate from civilian students, but of course using university infrastructure. Throughout the academic year, the soldiers train in intelligence methodologies, philosophy, and data collection at Hebrew University. And during the summer, they intern with the intelligence directorate, the Shin Bet, and the Mossad. Military leaders consider this program crucial, calling Chavatzalot soldiers central nodes of intelligence work. Many Chabad Salot soldiers serve in H200, Israel's leading intelligence core unit, responsible for collecting data on Palestinian phone calls, text messages, and emails. Whistleblowing soldiers from this unit corroborated what Palestinians have long reported, which is that the daily work of unit H200 includes gathering data used to try Palestinians in military courts without ever seeing the evidence against them and documenting personal information used to extort Palestinians into collaborating with the Israeli military and Shin Bet, including financial difficulties, sexual orientation, serious illness, or medical treatments needed by a loved one. And the last example I want to briefly share concerns weapons development. Uh, established through collaborations with the Technion, which is Israel's Institute of Technology, and other Israeli universities, 
Rafael, Israeli aerospace industries, and Elbit are Israel's leading military corporations and global exporters of technologies of war. First developed as nationally owned industries designed to supply domestically produced technologies to the Israeli state, their main client is the Israeli military and their products routinely target Palestinians. Elbit and Israeli uh, aerospace industries drones carrying Rafael missiles and F-16 fighter jets and Apache helicopters equipped by Elbit systems were used in Israeli offensives on the besieged Gaza Strip in 2008-2009, 2012, 2014, and 2021. The UN Human Rights Council, Human Rights Watch, and Amnesty International found Israel to have committed war crimes in all of these offensives due to its inadequate protection of Palestinian civilians. Yet following these offensives, Israel has marketed field-tested new technologies for international export. Through jointly run research programs, laboratories, scholarships, and grants, the Technion and other Israeli universities sustain this deadly infrastructure. So as Omo said, the academic boycott targets Israeli institutions and is directed at this institutional complicity. But I think that we can and should also ask, where are Israeli scholars in all of this? Why is there no sustained campaign by Israeli academics to protest the unscientific and overtly colonial use of the discipline of archaeology to facilitate the theft of Palestinian artifacts and lands? Why was the Israeli faculty opposition to Chabad Salot and the recruitment of the foremost Israeli Middle Eastern Studies Department by the Intelligence Corps so limited and short-lived, leaving it to Palestinian students? at Hebrew University to lead the struggle against yet another encroachment of the Israeli military onto their campus? Why is there no movement of Israeli academics to protest and interrupt the development of weapons and technologies in the laboratories and science departments across their institutions, technologies that are deployed against Palestinians and then exported abroad to boost Israel's status as a global leader in arms sales? The only way the only way to remake Israeli universities as democratic institutions with academic freedom for all is through decolonization. And that begins with the academic boycott. And so I urge all my fellow AAA members to vote yes on the resolution and you can do that today. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very powerful. And you really showed um, Omar's point that Israeli academia is not just complicit and it is certainly not independent, but it is a pillar of settler colonialism and apartheid. It sustains this deadly infrastructure in your words. Um, for those anthropologists listening, we will have a special Q&A session for uh, dealing with this issue of archeology's span um, role in, um, in the settler colonial project. That will be on July 7th, uh, sorry, July 11th. And for more information on that, you can email anthroboycott at gmail.com. So Omar, in response to our resolution, the Israeli Anthropological Association came out in opposition and claimed that Israeli academics are critical to the struggle for Palestinian rights and that they are currently resisting the new far-right Israeli government. I think Maya gave us some examples of how Israeli academics are silent on uh, many of these issues. What would you say to those who claim that we are punishing individual Israeli academics or violating their academic freedom. What would you say to those who say that boycotting Israeli universities would be counterproductive? These are arguments we are hearing. What would you say to those? Thanks, uh, Jessica. So I'll focus on the main two points you mentioned, punishing Israeli academics being the first point and then saving Israel's democracy. You know, we're busy saving Israel's democracy. Don't boycott us and bother us with this nonsense, basically. So let's go to the first argument. When Zionist Israeli academics first attacked PACB and the academic boycott call in 2004, 2005, they made that specious claim that the boycott targets academics, not just institutions. And they thought for a good reason, they could get away with it, despite the very clear language in the PACB call, because they assumed Western academics for the most part will not read the Palestinian call and will trust their fellow white Israeli scholars claim on face value. And many did, unfortunately. But academics eventually do read, believe it or not. And many have read the PACB call, and they saw clearly, and later the guidelines that PACB issued, that it was indeed very consistently an institutional boycott, explained in, in very clear language. 
Now, it is beyond shocking that 19 years later, the Israeli Anthropological Association and its anti-Palestinian accomplices in the US would still repeat the same lie. This is beyond intellectual dishonesty. It's truly pathetically desperate. The BDS movement upholds, as I said earlier, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and therefore calls for boycotting institutions, not individuals, targeting complicity, not identity. PACB subscribes to the UN definition of academic freedom, which prohibits the infringement on the academic freedom of others, as well as prohibits discrimination and repression. Anchored in precepts of international law and universal human rights, the BDS movement at large, including PACB, rejects on principle any McCarthyite-type political testing or boycotts targeting individuals based on their opinion or identity, ethnicity, race, gender, religion, and so on. If, however, an individual is representing the state of Israel or a complicit Israeli institution, a rector, a dean, a president of the university, they cannot claim I'm an individual academic. You're an official representing a complicit association, a complicit institution, and therefore you will be held accountable as a representative. You're no longer an individual uh, academic. So there's really nothing in the academic boycott that would target research and travel and joint collaborations with other academics and visits and absolutely nothing. We're ju just calling on all academics and all academic institutions to boycott Israeli academic institutions, period. Uh, now, the boycott conflicts with academic freedom regardless argument also confuses academic privileges with academic freedom. And it fails accordingly to grasp that an institutional academic boycott would harm perks and privileges, not rights. So if a Tel Aviv university is uh, boycotted by many Western universities, it will lose some resources and some of the academics will have less money to travel and maybe less luxurious laboratories. Those are not rights. Those are not human rights. Those are not academic freedom. Those are privileges, colonial privileges at that, at the expense of uh, uh, oppressing Palestinians. Some critics may argue still that BDS contravenes academic freedom because it cannot but hurt individual Israeli academics, no matter how much you avoid it by ignoring the real systematic Israeli suppression of academic freedom of the colonized indigenous Palestinians for decades and focusing solely on the hypothetical infringement on some perks that Israeli academics might lose, the colonizers might lose, this argument is patently racist and colonial. In the past, many academics supported a much more sweeping blanket academic boycott against South Africa in the apartheid era, which targeted universities as well as individual academics. Yet today, some of the same academics are reluctant to support a strictly institutional boycott of Israeli apartheid universities that are violating our rights every day. That's the definition of hypocrisy. But this is not the worst part. The worst part is really the defending democracy. You know, we're busy defending democracy, don't boycott us. By whitewashing the current conflict between two Israeli camps that equally support the continuation of Israel's system of settler colonialism and apartheid against indigenous Palestinians, while fighting over social, cultural, judicial, and economic policies and visions for the settler colony as somehow pro-democracy, the IAA, the Israeli Anthropological Association statement, makes me think the acronym better fits the name Israeli Apartheid Apologists, IAA. This IAA attitude reeks of white saviorism, horrible colonialism, and deep-seated racism against indigenous Palestinians. What mainly troubles the IAA and its ilk is not just the new Israeli government's radical policies, which they are in the social, cultural, uh, economic areas, they are, but they're really, really troubled that this government, Israel's most far-right, racist, authoritarian, corrupt, sexist, and homophobic ever, is completely dropping the mask that has covered Israel's 75-year-old regime of settler colonialism and apartheid against indigenous Palestinians. That's what's troubling them and everyone like them 
because they don't want that mask dropped. They want to maintain it and make Israel look like a nice liberal democracy while maintaining its savage, extremely violent uh, oppression of the Palestinians. Thank you. That was exceptionally eloquent. And I want to tell all of our listeners that this this uh, webinar will be available for you to listen again and to share um, the comments of our speakers, including those beautiful uh, comments by, well, beautiful, horrific, really um, great comments about a horrific uh, situation. So it will be available on this YouTube channel. Um, now, turning to Zoha, um, we've heard a lot about anti-boycott laws. And even some in the AAA leadership have brought up the potential legal implications for the association if we endorse boycott. But there's less attention paid to how um, misunderstandings or distortions of these problematic laws extend their chilling effect even further. Is this something you could address for us today? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, I think just like to, to begin at a really basic level, I think it's important for us to think about um, the arguments that that have been made against the, the boycott resolution. So for example, there's been an argument that the association is no longer going to be able to hold its annual meetings in states that have adopted laws against BDS. Um, and so one thing to think about is what those laws are, um, and then also to think about how those laws fit in with our legal framework. Um, so the laws that are targeting the BDS movement um, either include laws that are targeting state contracts. So they say that the state is not going to contract with entities that boycott Israel, or that they'll require um, entities to sign some kind of certification saying that they won't boycott Israel in order to enter into contracts with them. Um, and then there's also a different set that is irrelevant here, which is targeting uh, state investments in entities. And so, for example, uh, pension funds that are investing in companies um, will not invest in companies that boycott Israel. Now, if you look um, at the, you know, the, the fundamentals of the U.S. legal system, um, the supreme law of the land is going to be the Constitution, and the First Amendment protects our right to speak without facing government restrictions. And the courts have long recognized that boycotts are a form of speech. And so if the government is trying to pass a law, for example, that says you can't boycott Israel, that law would be clearly unconstitutional. It would get struck down. And so the way that states have tried to work around that is by saying that we are entering into these contracts for goods and services. And these contracts, um, we don't want to give the states money to entities that are discriminatory. And we also don't want to give the states money to an entity that's not going to be able to provide the, the best economic output for us because they're restricting the market in which they are um, able to make purchases of supplies that they're using in these state contracts. Um, so when these laws have been enforced, there have been legal challenges against them, saying that actually, even if you claim that this is just about the state doing business, what you are trying to do is silence people who have particular views, and that's a violation of the First Amendment, even if though you're trying to work around it. And again and again, we saw courts strike down these laws as being unconstitutional. Um, and so what the states did in response to these laws getting struck down is not to take the laws off the books, but to change the nature of the law so that they applied to a more restricted set of individuals. So for example, they put particular thresholds saying that it only applies to contracts of $100,000 or more, or it only applies to a company with 10 or more employees. And what those restrictions did was they narrowed the group of people that the laws would apply to, to narrow the, the group of people that could potentially um, oppose those laws in court. And so they still had these laws on the books, but they wanted not to actually apply the laws so that what the laws were doing was telling people that the states oppose BDS and not actually having to enforce it in a way that would allow someone then to go to court and to challenge the laws. There was one court that has upheld um, an anti-boycott law, and that was in Arkansas, um, where the newspaper the Arkansas Times not did not actually support BDS, but what they said was that they didn't want to comment on this issue. And as it worked its way through the Arkansas courts and um, through the, the Court of Appeals, that law was upheld because the court found that that wasn't a form of expression that was being made. And so it's possible that the analysis would be different if it was someone who did actually support BDS. Um, but it, but that, that case was appealed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court did not weigh in. And so there is 
this um, this unique place in Arkansas where um, the state's anti-boycott law has withstood judicial scrutiny just because the Supreme Court chose not to weigh in on that issue. But ultimately, if you're thinking about the way these laws are, are getting applied, these are contracts where people are trying to, for example, build a building for the state or um, to provide like janitorial services for the state or things that, that the, the state is contracting for a particular set of services. These laws have never been applied, as far as I know, to anyone's uh, ability to book, for example, a state-owned convention center. And if you really think about the way that that would operate is that the state would be providing its space, like a public venue, uh, based on someone's particular views. And that, again, gets back at the, the very fundamentals of like what the First Amendment is being made to protect. It's not... It's, meant to prevent the government from enacting a political litmus test for access to things like venues or the ability to speak um, in these, these public spaces. And so I think that if there were an effort to try to um, use the laws in those ways, it would be a very easy challenge against those laws and would serve to reaffirm the First Amendment's protection of boycotts. And so, you know, it's not something we've ever seen. And if we did see that, I think it would be a very easy legal challenge compared to um, the, the the more complicated approaches that have been, been taken by states to um, target contracts. The other thing that we see is, you know, with these states that are creating these like monetary thresholds or uh, numbers of employees to try to restrict the 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 direct application of these laws, um, we see pro-Israel groups cite to these laws as saying that the state has like a public policy against boycotts that is meant to then scare people in situations that have absolutely nothing to do with um, the like state contracts or anything like that. Uh, so, for example, in California, there is an anti-BDS law, nominally. Um, what that law specifically says is that state agencies will not contract with someone for um, a contract of $100,000 or more um, unless that entity certifies that any boycott it has that's you know targeting a sovereign nation, including Israel, um, does not violate its the state's existing anti-discrimination laws. So it doesn't actually create any new restrictions on what people are allowed to do. It just requires them to sign this additional provision saying that they're not engaging in discrimination. And as we've discussed, the institutional boycott is not something that is a violation of anti-discrimination laws, either at the, the state level in California or even at the international level in the, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. This is something that has been specifically crafted not to cause individual um, harm. It's meant to, you know, express a political opinion and to, you know, not allow us to provide, you know, financial support or pl a platform for entities that disagree with us politically. And so this, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, um, but, uh, so this this effort, um, this uh, particular law in California has been cited by Israeli government officials. For example, um, the city of Alameda was trying to enter into a sister city relationship with a Palestinian village that, you know, activists within that um, city had been very active in, in going there and visiting and seeing what was going on. And I think they helped build a soccer field there. And they had wanted to establish like a formal relationship between their small city and this Palestinian village, which, you know, the